live blogging your own talk. Yeah. Yeah. streaming for YouTube. So if you no, get into me, I got it right. So you got it right. Uh, which is by Sunday morning. Uh, <coughs> So by Saturday night, then there's a good chance I can get you to get it turned around and get comments to you by the end of the weekend. But then uh, I'll be in the conference for two days. You get it to me by Tuesday, uh, late afternoon. Then I have one more day when I can read it before I can do it. So, and then, you know, it's like I'm out of action for you. More days, so. I mean, I'd love to take whatever I can go over. Yeah. Should I do that? Might have been on the other side. That's fine. That's fine. So, in that case, it doesn't really matter when you get it to someone who would be better. I can't get it to you. By the end of the next year. I can go to New York Saturday, but I would still like you. Yeah, 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 that's fine, that's fine. I'll send out an email to all the people who are doing papers about getting an extension. Okay, so I should, I should wait on you before I send you an email requesting the official extension. I, uh, I, I, I can do a blank, I can cover the blank extension. Oh, okay, great. You can use it. I get it fast. Thanks for that. Thank you, guys. California. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Did you dig Google for what I was telling you and that's what came up? Yes. Okay, so just um, two administrative things. Administrative thing one is we'll do the evaluations at the end today. Uh, if you have your laptops, you do them online. I think you know the drill. If you don't have your laptop with you, that's fine. You have, I think, till the end of exam period to do them. So please do them. Um, I would be especially appreciative of any thoughts about format for next year. I know it won't benefit you, but for future students, like, um, I've done this exact same class with one speaker a week. Would you prefer that? Was it a good idea to have a complete rough draft in the interim week? <clears throat> Other ways I could structure that, like you just write a thesis summary and then write the critical part afterwards. Anyway, any thoughts you have about the way the class is structured, um, I'm very interested in them and would appreciate them. Uh, so the second administrative thing is you should now have back all five, uh, excuse me, five of the six papers, but not, you, and you already have paper six back, I think, everyone has paper six back, but you don't have paper five back, you'll get that back by about Wednesday or so, and uh, uh, if you are enrolled in the WR version of the class, uh, I'll be sending out a communication regarding uh, deadlines for the final paper. Uh, and that will have all the information about that. Okay, with that out of the way, um, I'm uh, uh, just going to do what I traditionally do, uh, which is not to introduce Josh, but to, he doesn't need an introduction, uh, but instead to tell you a little bit about why I invited him. So, um, I, as, as you probably figured out now, I invite different people for different reasons. Uh, and one of the reasons I invited Josh is because he's at the very beginning of his career, but he's someone who created quite a profile for himself before he even entered the legal academy and uh, uh, doing lots of interesting things. So I thought that uh, this would be a really good opportunity for us to see someone at the beginning stage and also, it'd be a good opportunity for Josh to get his work out. And believe me, I've been, I remember being a first year law professor when it was very difficult to get invitations to speak. And so I sort of try to do uh, my part uh, to promote um, uh, beginning stage scholars. So, Josh Blackman.
Uh, Professor Solomon, Professor Barnett, thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed an honor to be here. Uh, this is probably my most high-profile speaking gig yet, and hopefully it will lead to others. Um, all of you, thank you so much for your reaction papers. I read all of them, and I will try to actually work them into my uh, presentation today. Um, you should consider yourselves very fortunate to have these two guys on your faculty. Uh, you, they are at the vanguard of constitutional law, and I don't say that, I don't say that lightly. Um, the topic I'm talking about today is especially pertinent because this gentleman here was the godfather. Um, he made the president all frequent refuse, and it almost worked. So a lot of what I'll be talking about today relates directly to what Professor Barnett has done, and as well, a lot of the commentary that Professor Solom has written about but after the case. So let's just take a step back. The Affordable Care Act case, which you all know, a couple months ago went right down the road. It happened really, really, really fast. It really began November 2009. And over the course of a little bit less than three years, it went through a lot of changes. Constitutional law usually evolves at a somewhat glacial pace. Um, think about Heller, for example. It took almost 20 or 25 years to get a case to the Supreme Court arguing what's the original meaning of the Second Amendment. Um, these things take a while. But there are times when, out of necessity, you have to move quick. Perhaps the best example is Bush v. Gore. In a span of 20 days, Ted Olson came up with an argument about why Florida's recount violates the protection clause. That was a very quick thing, and everyone had to jump behind it. Uh, very quickly, you had all the leading Republicans saying, yes, this is an equal protection violation. Forget state rights. But, you know, this is an equal protection violation. And we have these quick changes. NFIB wasn't quite that quick, but it was pretty fast. And when you move fast, you have to make a lot of decisions. When you make these decisions, you're not always able to uh, fully appreciate and grasp when you're in the moment, because you're always thinking, what do we do next? How do we win this argument? When, when are we going out to Richmond? When are we going to Atlanta? When are we going to Pensacola? So what I aimed to do in this paper was take that step back and try and draw several lessons, big, broad lessons that we can appreciate. Um, this was a paper which I contributed to the Chapman Law Review that was a symposium on libertarian thought after the healthcare case. Um, and to preempt a lot of your comments, I'm very much aware that a lot of the ideas aren't fully fleshed out. I had about six weeks to write this. Uh, so it was very short, and I, I fully intend on uh, ramping something to a full-length law review article, maybe even two articles. Uh, also, I'm actually writing a book about the healthcare cases. So if your comments that this is an overly descriptive article, that's, that's very astute, because a lot of what I'm incorporating was my account of how this case evolved. And the reason why the account of how this case evolved is because this case did not just transpire inside the court. This wasn't about textualism. It wasn't really about originalism. It wasn't so much about precedent. Rather, this was about how the Constitution was changed outside the courts, to quote Jack Balkan, taking ideas from off the wall, putting them onto the wall. And people like Randy Barnett and many others put their lives into this case for three years to work and get this case onto the wall. So I'll start by just giving a brief sketch of the first few lessons, and I'll focus most of my talk on the final lessons. One thing to just stress, um, when I teach in my class, I like to have a lot of interaction. Um, I don't like talking that much, so I have a live chat open. If any of you have a computer, go to that website, today's meet slash GULC, and put some questions there. I can see it right here. And that way, I can kind of weave into my narrative what you're asking about. Tr trust me, it works. I do this with lecture with 70 kids, and it actually works fairly well. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you, can, you can type questions there. I don't need to, you don't need to, don't call me maybe. Um, so, let's begin. I think the first two big lessons we should draw from this case is how the entire judicial activism, judicial restraint dichotomy crumbled. Um, and I realize I'm grossly oversimplifying, and I hope you'll indulge me just a bit. But for generations, the general divide was li liberals, progressives, tended to like activist judges. They liked judges who were counter-majoritarian, who can recognize rights, who would um, uh, help reinforce representation of those who don't have access to courts. This was something that was very much in the van. And by and large, conservatives, in response or in backlash, or however you want to describe it, were the opposite. They said, no, we should have judges who are restrained in the model of Robert Bork, that the Ninth Amendment's an inkblot, and we should not be stepping outside of our shoes to try and uh, uh, find rights. I think a lot of this decay started crumbling when we started getting to the Rehnquist Court in the so-called New Federalism era. With these cases, there was suddenly a realization that, wait a minute, the New Deal Court might have, not might have, but New, New Deal Court erred, and we're not able to fix that but maybe we can ratchet it back, or, or this far but no farther, so to speak. So conservatives started having a little bit less of a, a hostility to courts engaging the entire Constitution. Um, and we saw this in cases like Lopez, Morrison, Seminole Tribe, Alden B. Maine, um, uh, leading up to Raich, and I'll get to Raich in a few minutes. But conservatives 
became more accepting of this. Then we had the case in the 2000s. We had Citizens United. We had DCV Heller. We had McDonald v. Chicago. And these all are cases where judges who are conservatives and points by Republicans are more willing to strike down laws. And then we have the dissenters in Citizens United, and the dissenters in Heller, and the dissenters in McDonald, who say, no, 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 we need to defer to the democratic process. And I feel almost like I'm entering a bizarro world with how this reversal of, of roles has, has ensued. Um, the key difference, and of course you're smart to realize this, is we're talking about different rights. Here we're talking about rights conservatives and libertarians like, like guns and free speech, and in other cases, the rights that progressives have to like, you know, like, like my affirmative action or abortion or whatever you want. But I think this helps to hit home that these, the, these talking points, which, which conservatives are so good at, that we need restrained judges, we need, you know, who won't legislate from the bench. I mean, it, it doesn't have that much teeth when you get down to it. Um, one small note, and you probably realize this, but if you look at the vote in um, uh, healthcare cases, of course, Justice Roberts was the whatever, however you want to call it. He was also the vote in Citizens United to say we shouldn't go too far. So keep, keep that in mind. Roberts, I don't think, ever fully embraced the new federalism to the extent that maybe O'Connor or Rehnquist did. Uh, I will get to footnote four in a minute. That's a very good point. Um, and we talked about the artificial bifurcation of rights, but we, we will get that in a minute. I think a, a third lesson is judges and conservative judges. Um, it's been said that during the Bush administration, one of the sole criteria for a judge is, will this person uphold the war on terror? That was it. That, that, that was one of the main focuses. And actually, it's funny, but, but then Circuit Judge John Roberts uh, joined Judge Randolph's opinion in... Uh, so it's Hamdi or Hamdan, and four days later he was appointed to the Supreme Court. It was actually, if you actually look at the timing, the opinion is that Hamdi or Hamdan, whichever one the D.C. Circuit was, was like four days before the Roberts nomination. And the speculation that, that that's kind of what Bush was looking for. He wanted a judge to uphold Guantanamo. But the same kind of judge who will be willing to defer to the executive and defer to the legislature is the same type of judge who will twist and turn and do pirouettes so as not to strike a law down. Look at the Chiefs for the Northwest Austin case. He did, you know, like figure eights around the Constitution to get rid of the Voting Rights Act, and they might kill it this term. Look at Citizens United. Roberts was very restrained. He said we should not go too far. Um, and then, of course, look at his uh, look at his opinion in this in the healthcare cases. Um, did they read it for this class or elsewhere? Have you actually read the Roberts opinion? It's it's a it's jurisprudential jujitsu. That's the only way I can describe it. He's jumping up and down to find ways to save it. But that is the, the mold. This is what Professor Barnett has called the divide between judicial conservatives and constitutional conservatives. Whereas the judicial conservatives in the mold of Robert Bork, J. Harvey Wilkinson, and I'll add John Roberts, Jeff Sutton, Brett Kavanaugh, who are willing to, um, who are less willing to enforce the Constitution as they see it and find easier ways to defer to the democratic process. Um, the other camp would be what, I, what Randy, uh, Professor Barnett would call a constitutional conservative. That is, a judge who is willing to engage the Constitution. Um, if you guys have seen uh, Clark Milley from the Institute for Justice, he has a really good article about judicial engagement, which, which is more or less a, a way of saying, you can't, footnote four, you can't pick and choose what parts of the Constitution you like. I told you I was getting there. You can't pick and choose which parts of the Constitution you want to enforce. Footnote four is an artificial bifurcation of rights, those in the Bill of Rights, those out. One small note, Second Amendment, in the Bill of Rights, Stevens' opinion, Breyer's opinion, wrong. People don't, yeah. Breyer actually cited footnote four saying the Second Amendment should not get such protection even though it's in the Bill of Rights. So take that to the bank. Um, so we actually have this idea that we should engage all provisions of the Constitution. We shouldn't pick economic rights or uh, reproductive rights or you know, executive power, whatever your choice is. We say there's a Constitution, it has a meaning, we're going to go there. Conservatives confer. Ah. Uh, so I think this leads into what I think is my fourth point which is really libertarians. And I think it's important to kind of distinguish libertarians and conservatives, um, specifically because conservatives, by and large, have accepted, um, have accepted the idea of footnote four Carolyn products. They're okay with it because they don't want Roe. I mean, they, 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 don't like, they don't like Lochner. They don't like Roe. They don't like substantive due process. So in that sense, um, footnote four is a way for them to save themselves. Um, but we saw in this last case that conservatives, in really the last 10 years, have been willing to eschew precedents. They've been willing to strike down, you know, Austin versus uh, Chamber of Commerce and Citizens United. They're willing to strike down U.S. v. Miller, which was a 70-year-old press in the Second Amendment. Uh, they're willing to, to perhaps strike down, or at least cabin, the extent of Wickard and Lopez and Morrison to an extent, or Darby and those other cases. 
So, so conservatism is not really about keeping old precedents to the extent that you're not like in the John Roberts camp. Because what Roberts did was very tricky, and I'll answer your question in this way. He didn't adhere to the old precedents. He accepted the five votes, I think there were five votes to strike down the mandate as a violation of commerce and the state proper. But what he did was he found a way to save under tax. So Roberts wasn't interested in saving old precedents. He was just interested in not pissing off the, the elected branches and not making people upset. He had a very finite way of accomplishing that, which, which, which fits into this mold. If you look at uh, what Judge Sutton did and what Judge Kavanaugh did, they, never, they, they kind of went around the issue to try and resolve it. At least Roberts said, okay, I'll give you five votes because I'm in the Supreme Court. Robert, uh, Kavanaugh and Sutton couldn't do that. But Roberts said, we're going to save on this front. Um, when I originally wrote this paper, we saw a presidential election coming up. I said, wow, this might actually impact the next presidential election. Who will be appointed to the Supreme Court? Not so much. So we have at least four more years before we have to worry about this. But I think you can be pretty certain that if there's a Republican nominee to the Supreme Court, say replace Justice Scalia in 20, you know, 2017, whatever the year happens to be, that candidate will be asked, what do you think about the doctrine of primary powers? How would you feel about judicial restraint? These are the kinds of questions which I think will be posed. Um, Justice Kagan was asked by I think, Senator Sessions, uh, can the government make leave broccoli? Uh, that question didn't go too far, I suppose, when she was being confirmed. So that's really the fourth lesson about libertarians. And on libertarians, I think the most interesting facet is the relationship between libertarianism and originalism. A lot of you put in your comments something to the same effect, that I assume that the Constitution is a libertarian document, or I assume that the Constitution compels libertarian results. Um, Professor Barnett wrote a, he gave the, uh, the Simon lecture at Cato a couple years ago, in which he said that the Constitution is a libertarian document. And uh, I commend it all to, to read. Um, so I, I, won't, I won't defend that position. I think he does it much, much more ably than I can. What I'll say is, I'm not saying whether the Constitution is libertarian or not. What I will say is that, by and large, most libertarians have hung their hats on the jurisprudence of, of originalism for the last 10 years, 15 years, by and large. It's saying, listen, we've gone too far from the framers' vision of the Constitution, how it was originally understood, and we need to ratchet back to that in some form or another. In the ACA case, that was not the case. Libertarians did not advance originalist challenge. And the reason why is because it wouldn't have gone anywhere, it would have lost. But that also means they didn't advance it. And that's important. I say this is the originalist dog that didn't bark. Why didn't they advance it? And if they didn't advance it here, does that weaken the jurisprudence? A number of you made comments to the effect of, uh, if you sacrifice the methodology for the end, you weaken the, the methodology in the long term. I think there is some, there, there is some salience to that, that, it, that if you uh, arbitrarily pick and choose when you're an originalist, this is what Scalia's alluded to as faint-hearted originalism, you, you in essence are able to um, give firepower to the critics of originalism and say, this is just something used to get to a libertarian and conservative end. Um, I don't think that's the necessary conclusion, and I, I draw a different conclusion in part five of my paper, but I think that that could flow from it. Um, and also, a, a cor cor correlative of that is the way popular constitutionalism worked. Um, this challenge was very much geared to the people. This challenge arose at the same time as the Tea Party. This arose in 2010 with the midterm elections. This arose when President Obama was quite unpopular. This channel of the Fox News, Wall Street Journal, talk radio, uh, 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 sentiments toward the president's health care law, and it was quite effective. Um, I was at a, uh, in a journalistic capacity, I was at a Tea Party rally on March 21st, 2010, the day the law was enacted, and I was just walking around. I saw a guy with the signs that overturned Wickard v. Filburn. A random guy had a sign that overturned Wickard v. Filburn. I didn't know what that was until I got to my second year of law school. Uh, you know, you have people sitting around waving around constitutions. Uh, it, there was, a, there was a, a rededication, a Hanukkah, if you will, to the constitution, in, in, in this time period, which, which was simultaneous. And I think it would create the perfect storm for Professor Barnett and others to, to advance this challenge and bring it forward to the Supreme Court. Uh, the timing was, was, really, was really impeccable. Uh, and I think, in, by and large, that a lot of libertarians kind of channeled the work of popular constitutionalism that Balkan and Riva Siegel and Bob Post have written about, the way we can speak to the Constitution directly to the people and the courts react to that. And I think what you saw with opinions by Judge Vincent in the district court was actually that, that sentiment that, that the courts were gaining an understanding of how people viewed the Constitution. Um, Vincent's opinion had direct references to the Tea Party and the and Boston tax, or the, the tea tax in it. Um, but it's still important to stress that there was not an originalist challenge here, and I think that, that is something that needs to be analyzed further. Um, the fifth part of the paper uh, uh, relates to Professor Salom's Gestalt. How do you say it? 
from Scrivener of Gestalt. I had actually written something similar over the summer, and then he put it so much better than I did, I kind of reworked the paper. Because I, I also kind of sensed that there was this kind of uh, change in the thinking. And to respond to some of your questions, saying one case is not enough to affect the change, I think that's a fair criticism. Um, but what I will respond to that is this wasn't just one case. This was a three-year process. It's very hard to look at this as just one opinion, because a lot of stuff has to be done to get there. There were stump speeches, there were politicians. I've, I've gone through the entire legislative history of this bill, all of it. And there were just so many speeches on the floor about the Constitution, and people talking about the Constitution. And you had President Obama giving a little comma lecture saying, not since the Lockdown Court has this happened. And you had you know, judges saying that this is, you know, this, is, this is unconstitutional. And you had lawyers, and you had people, and you had, uh, we, had a, we almost had a presidential election based on it, but Mitt Romney wasn't very good candidate for that. Uh, he had his own issues with health care. But we had, the, <clears throat> we had this focus on the Constitution. And I think this jolted the notion that race ended the new federalism. I think that, that ratcheted back. Because after race, which was, I started law school in 06, so I was relatively a, a young pup. I think, actually you I think you taught race in David Bernstein's class my year. I think that might be possible. Um, but when I was in law school, people saying, oh, race, you know, this is it, it's over. But I think what race represents is a simple recognition that the Supreme Court was taking this, this way of looking at it, saying, listen, we'll go, we'll assume the New Deal is right, we won't like it, but we'll say this far and no further. And in race, Scalia, Kennedy said, this is, this is governed by Wicker, so we're not going further. But what NFIB says is, this far, no further applies, this went too far. Mandating inactivity, regulating inactivity is too far, you can't do it. And I think what scares um, opponents of this case the most is not the Chief Justice's, like, you know, whatever tax opinion, it's the fact that now there's a notion that the New Deal settlement hasn't been settled, or the Gestalt, that there is this, this question about it. And even if we can't go back and reverse the New Deal, which I don't think will happen, I don't think most people want to happen, there's this notion that if you want to go further, the government has to justify it. And that, the government failed. The Solicitor General was not able to say, what's your principle? Why can you do this? Why? You know, when this case first started, everyone kept saying, oh, this is race, this is wicker, this is easy. And it wasn't. Once they got a couple questions from hostile judges, it, it crumbled. Like, like, it just fell apart. So then they say, okay, what's our justification? And the government never was able to do that. So I think what you'll see in the next challenge, and who knows what it'll be, broccoli mandates, who knows what it'll be, but this notion that if you want to go further than what the court has gone before, you're going to have to justify it. And it's going to be a substantial burden, just as Kennedy said during arguments that uh, to the Solicitor General, you bear a burden because this is a substantial change in relation between the people and the government. This is your burden, General. This is not the burden of Randy Barnett or, or, or Alan Gura. This is a burden of the government. And I think that is perhaps the most enduring legacy of this case, even if the outcome wasn't governed by originalism. Even if the outcome wasn't strike down the mandate, the work of originalists to understand the scope of the New Deal went too far, enabled this holding. It allowed us to see we should be compelling the government to say why should these further infringements and individual liberty persist. And that, I think, is the most important lesson to draw from the healthcare case. I thank you much for your time. Okay, the floor is open. Hit him up. Oh, come on. Yes, sir. Aren't you kind of begging the question? about engaging the entire Constitution versus engaging parts of the Constitution. I mean, I would, I would assume that, you know, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer, if we were to get them, would say that they're just as committed as to enforcing the entire Constitution as, as, as their colleagues. I mean, I mean it, it, I'm not sure how exactly you would go about asking a appointment, an appointee what you would want to know other than how would you decide a specific case. Yeah, I think, would you put that in your question in the, in the reflection papers? I think I saw that question. I, I made a note of that because it was a good question. I don't think that's true. People who adhere to footnote four of currently products do not want to engage in the entire constitution. They'll say if there's some rights which have a different level of importance that they're treated with rational basis review, and rational basis review is a rubber stamp. So I, I don't think they would say that. In fact, Justice Breyer is extremely hostile to free speech. Read his dissent in Sorrell v. IMS Health, and in other recent cases, he, he, he does not. Read his dissent in the Second Amendment case. He, I've written elsewhere that Breyer treats the Second Amendment as a, as a subordinate right, as like the redheaded stepchild of this Constitution. So I don't think that. Um, but, but just as well, I don't think conservatives are willing to fully embrace you know, protections under the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Uh, Professor Barnett just saw at McDonald, and you had four justices who, who just want to turn a blind eye to the PRI Clause. So I don't think any of the, uh, and only Thomas, who I would say is probably the, the, the most committed originalist, the most committed, uh, engaged judge, 
said, listen, this due process stuff is wrong as a matter of original meaning. I'd go back and look at PRI. And that's how, and that was the tie vote in McDonald, by the way. That was the fifth vote for the holding. So the, under traditional rules, that would be the most narrow holding. That would be, that would be the rule. But um, Judge Easterbrook had an opinion in Seventh Circuit where he basically said, ah, don't worry about Thomas. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's no, no big deal. It's, it's due process. Because courts have actually looked at this afterwards. But that, that was a very good question. I think it, it would apply just as easily as to Scalia and Alito as it would to Breyer and Ginsburg. But I think it's a fair point. Yes, sir. Edward, um, thanks for giving us opportunity to review your paper. And Thank you. To, uh, to get a chance to question you today. Um, I, it was interesting to me that it seems to be trying to form a narrative um, that looks at NFIB through a particular lens, and, and like I said, you're going to be developing this paper more. Um, but it seemed that your lens was particularly targeted, and mm -hmm. so it kind of ignored all the. So, what I kind of did in my critique was attempt to look at all the five uh, factors that you. That you uh, that you raised, and then gave plausible alternatives for mm -hmm. differently interpreting them um, that would give you a completely different outcome of how to look at NFIB. And I think that, and so I guess my first kind of suggestion that mm -hmm. you kind of want to, if I were to address those things, um, because they are like seemingly very plausible alternatives, like Chief Justice Roberts not necessarily being a, cons uh, a, a judicial conservative, but um, having a much more, um, maybe a less noble um, idea about you know, writing in FIB, is the, et cetera. So I kind of raised some of those things. And that, I mean, these are not novel ideas. I mean, they were said by plenty of people. Mm -hmm. and so, but I guess my most target, my, what I kind of like to hit um, in question form, is do you really think that there's been a constitutional shift in the popular demographic? I mean, the, the, some of the most uh, violent or, um, or interesting challenges on the constitutional grounds um, work came from like the Tea Party, which is an extremist wing of the Republican Party. I mean, there's, I mean, or at least it's an adopter of the Republican Party over the last few years. I would, I would be extremely hesitant to say that the Tea Party is representative of popular America. I mean, you know, like seventy percent of Americans oppose the mandate. That's true. This is not just, it's not just fringe people. No, 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 no I agree, and I, and I, and I that point that I accept. I mean, I can't, we can't fight the Pope. But there's something, but there's something to the also that that all, not all the pieces of the, of the healthcare law were. Oh, popularly, actually, significant portion of them were popularly supported, mm -hmm. and so it seems like it's much more nuanced. Like you seem to suggest that um, the popular, the popular voice says we want a more originalist interpretation of the Constitution, but I'm not convinced that that is the case, or at least not on the federalism grounds that you seem to be thinking uh, popular support is behind. Mm -hmm. Like that's a very nuanced position that. Uh, that the federal government doesn't have the authority to do this and state governments might um, is a very nuanced position and I didn't that's not what I heard from the cries of, of kind of like even what we're seeing the majority. I don't, I don't think people who in the seventy percent said I think on I think on federal grounds they can't do this. Okay, and, and I, I think Ily Ily Sumlin's written about this in the point of political ignorance, uh, and I I'll, I'll leave I'll leave that to him. And actually it's Edward Williams did I, yours is actually one of the better ones. I actually really liked your paper. Uh, and I, th I think you make a. <laughs> no, I did. You don't want to say it that way. <laughs> no, I, th I, no, I thought he made. I thought he made very fair points. So now I, I, I digest them and I can respond to them. So the when you're trying to, oh, can I respond to this? Can I add a quick question? Of course. Can you talk about your methodology for staying objective? Let's keep. Let what, make, why don't we? Well, there was a lot in. Uh, I, I, I can weave it in, and, and, and then we'll and then we'll get to Meg's question. Okay, I'm actually going to try to kill, kill two birds. I think I think they're, they're, they 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 piggyback. So I think you had, had one line in your in your, um, in your in your paper. There's nothing wrong with the, with the narrative except that every point he makes seems to fit a storyline. Um, I I think my response to that would be. I was able to observe a lot of these things happening in real time. And I observed them from an interesting vantage point because I was actually clerking at the time. And I had to forcefully keep myself distanced from the actual litigation. Um, had I not been clerking, I'd probably been much more involved than I was. So I, I blogged a lot, but actually, if you look at my blog, I had nothing about this case for most three as well as clerking. So I, I had to force myself. And I will admit, at the outset, I was very skeptical of Professor Barnett's arguments. I was extremely skeptical. And to go to your point, I didn't think that it had legs. Um, I still don't know if it has legs. I mean, in all honesty, even up until the day the case was decided, I was actually on the fence of what I thought would happen, what I wanted to happen. I, I was actually um, 
I remember telling a friend, like, I'm legitimately worried that this can become an election issue and, and, and this will become very bad. So I'm not coming from this as, as someone who's trying to force um, a specific narrative. Um, rather, this is simply how I viewed what happened. I viewed how, at the outset, progressive professors and opponents of this law were extremely dismissive about this. But that didn't last very long. And something changed. There are lots of constitutional arguments that make no sense, that go nowhere. But something about this argument was able to capture people. I don't know if it was just a simple saying, broccoli. I don't know if it's simple saying government can't force you to have any activity, but something about this happened. Under most circumstances, when a president passes a landmark piece of legislation, that's actually the end of the story. He had both houses. He had a very popular support. This was his mandate, no pun intended. But something happened. What happened is what I try to draw from this narrative. And when I go through the chronology of almost three years of events and the evolution of the thinking on both sides, what it seems to me is that people start to realize, wait a minute, our country isn't what we thought it was. Our Constitution isn't what we thought it was in 2009, where we could just pass this law and Speaker Pelosi can say, are you kidding me with constitutional challenges? That's what people thought it was. But that's not where it is anymore. It changed, it moved. And what my narrative is saying is how it moved. You might disagree with me about the sequence of events, but I think you have to agree that something changed and something moved. And we are not in the same place we were in 2009. And that is the gestalt Professor Solomon's referred to. That is this shift, this change, this metamorphosis. And you might differ with me over the degree or, or, or extent of it, but something happened, and it happened quick. And this is, I think, one of the first stabs at trying to pin it down. And I, and I welcome competing narratives. I, 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 I mean that generally. I don't think I have all the right answers. Um, I know I don't. You know, I'm just, I'm just some guy with a blog. But I think this does make a certain amount of sense if you view it in this large perspective. So I hope I've answered both of your questions. So I actually, I, I think you've answered uh, your kind of merits. I really just want to know about your process. I don't, what do you, you mean process? On the other side. I'm sorry? Who, like what liberal scholars are you reading and? I, I, I mean, for my book, I've done over 75 interviews with everyone from like Jack Balkan. I'm talking to Neil Katyal tomorrow. Okay. I mean, I've, 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 I've Marty Liedem, I'm seeing later today. I've, I've talked to just about everyone. Reva Siegel, I mean, uh, Bob Post, Jesus, I mean, Look at, look at Professor Solomon's legal theory blog. I probably talked to most of the people who are linked there. Um, I, I, I've done a significant amount of research on this case. Um, and I, I was actually working on an article on popular constitution before this case even came out. And I was able to largely contribute it. I mean, before this even started, I was working on something on popular constitution and libertarianism. I was talking on the Second Amendment context, about how the Heller case came about. And then once this happens, like, oh, wow, that's a new medium. So I've been reading this stuff for, for a while. Um, I've talked to Balkan for hours on this. Um, so I, I, I've tried my best. Uh, I think I did cite Professor Solomon's SSRN piece, the Gestalt, because that's not been published yet. Uh, and as far as a difference between restraint and deference, uh, that's a good question. Let me, let me get at that. I'll think of some more. Uh, was Brown v. Board conservative or liberal, using your definition of those terms? Oh, hmm. Was Brown v. Board conservative? I, I don't think Brown... Do you mean uh, judicial conservative or constitutional conservative? Is that, the, is that what you're asking? I mean, I mean the, the position in, in Brown that would have been conservative was the position of William Rehnquist as a law clerk, where he says, no, we keep Plessy. That would probably be the conservative position, uh, but no, no one bit that. Um, although, one interesting thing about Brown is Brown didn't actually do that much. If you actually read Brown, it was actually very constrained. It didn't desegregate school. It said with all deliberate speed. And it took another five or six or seven years of other opinions to kind of do the dirty work. So in many respects, Brown was more conservative than, than most people give credit for. Sir. So well, if we think Brown is part of the Gestalt, and it won't become that important until well, later development actually took place, how do you know this ACA case will change the Gestalt itself without knowing what will happen after? Well, I think, I think the, uh, I don't know what will happen in the future. And I use this kind of analogy. If I were to ask any of you in 1999, what's the next big Supreme Court case? You have never said, you'll decide the Florida election. You have just, that would have never thought to you. If I were to ask you in 2000, you know, September 10th, 2001, what's the next big case? Guantanamo would have never been on your mind. You know, if I were to ask you, you know, in uh, 2004, what's the next big case? No one would think about the Second Amendment. That had been a dead letter for 70 years. If I had asked Randy on, like, November... 11, 2009, 
what's going to be the next big case? No one will think about the mandate. I mean, the, 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 the reason why I can answer the question is you never know what the Constitution will, will lead. What we do know is how things start, settle now and how they settled a couple years ago. And to go back to, to that, his question, things are slightly different now than they were before. How this portends for the future, I don't know. That's why we say the Gestalt is unsettled. I haven't said the Gestalt settles somewhere else, so that's not like migrated. It's just in flux. Uh, it, it's in a state of change. And it's not crystallized as we had thought it was. There were, there were several other um, um, papers that discussed uh, the Gestalt. Um, uh, uh, John, you had a question about the Gestalt, and Joe, uh, your paper talked a little bit about the Gestalt. Maybe we, uh, do you want to do you want to follow that up? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Ben. For me, my question was really on how far you had to go, and so I didn't believe that Professor Solom went quite as far as you did in his paper. So I thought he had signified that we had rocked the existing uh, constant, what he described as the constitutional gestalt, or the, the, the theory as it is. But I don't think that he was going as far as to say that we've actually established a new one. And so I don't think I said, I think you misread what I wrote. Did you use the word crystallize? I think you see this in that quote. Was that your paper? Yeah. I, th I, think, I think it was in a slightly different context. I think what I said in that sentence was the New Deal settlement had crystallized. And now that crystallization has been unsettled. I think that's, I think there was a slight, maybe I, I wrote it in a confusing manner. But I, I don't think this new settlement has crystallized at all. I don't. Um, and to go back to your question, sir, I, I think it's going to take the next case to see what this means. Um, or, or, but the more likely effect is not the next case, but the next president who's thinking about doing something will think twice. That's kind of like the, the sort of Damocles, so to speak. It's not, you know, it doesn't need to get to one first street. It can stop at 1600. You go out saying, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't do this. You know, if you were giving President Obama advice back in 2009, maybe you said, maybe we should just make this a tax. You know, forget political. You know, let's just make this a tax. And then we would have been out. We, we would have been done. If, if they did this, like, you know, there's this great story uh, Frances Perkins related years ago. She was a, a secretary of uh, the Labor Department during the New Deal. And she tells this great story that when FDR was considering Social Security, they didn't know how they can do it through the Commerce Clause. And then she went to a party, and she bumped into then Justice Hughes. And they were just chit-chatting. It was a tea party. And, no pun intended, but they were just chit-chatting. And she goes to Justice Hughes, you know, we have, this, we have this law. We don't know how to do it. And then Hughes goes and quotes something like, my dear, the taxing power is all you need. And as the lawyer goes, she ran back to the Labor Department and said, we got to make this a tax. We make this a tax. And in Helvering, Supreme Court said, you can hold this as a tax. This is a choice that President Obama did not make. He did not want to raise taxes because that was his campaign promise. Another one of his campaign promises was no individual mandate. Go back and look at the debate between him and Hillary in 2008. It's hilarious. Hillary says, we need a mandate. And Obama says, no, we will not force people to have health care. It's actually really funny. But he said, we will not raise taxes. So he made a decision. We'll do this under commerce. And at the time, no one in the White House thought this was even conceivably constitutionally deficient. The House of Representatives made no findings whatsoever about constitutionality. Uh, to answer your question, I've talked to people at ACS, and they drafted a number of the findings for the Senate about why this was constitutional. I talked to the guy who wrote them. Um, and they insist, like, listen, you've got to do this, because this is not as settled as you think it is. But there was this almost a hubris, so to speak, of that this is fine. Today, that hubris is gone. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm the other guy who wrote about the next um, Thank you. And I also talked about crystallization, too. And my question to you is, what do you think about cases like Lopez and Morrison, which came out before uh, so this case went through and kind of already shattered the New Deal? Mm -hmm. Stalin? Mm -hmm. No, and I think that this goes to what point Professor Barnett has made, was it, it's not that Lopez and Mo this is what I think people don't get about the new federalism. They didn't reverse the New Deal. They simply said, this far but no farther, without justification. In other words, Lopez and Morrison didn't reverse Wickard. They didn't reverse Darby or, or Jones and Laughlin. They didn't reverse any of those cases. They said, this is something further than what, what the New Deal court allowed. So when we get to Raich, they're saying, listen, this is controlled by Wickard. You're not outside the New Deal sphere. So you win, the government. Because in, 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 in Wickard, I'm sorry, Raich, Professor Barnett had to justify why this was unconstitutional. He had the burden. Go listen to the arguments in the Supreme Court. Who had the burden? It's the government. Very hostile, but the government had the burden, and they failed. Well, no, they, 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 they won. They, they, they were saved by grace, I suppose. But they... But the, but the argument was framed as, Solicitor General, what is your argument? Why do you satisfy this burden? 
And that's how the entire litigation was, was styled. Uh, someone made a point saying I shouldn't be focusing on the litigation style, but I should focus on the outcome. I think that's a fair point, but it's very likely that the outcome wasn't what it was, um, which might be, might be important enough as it is. But I'm trying to just see how the case was postured from the outset, that it was framed in terms of the government satisfying this burden at all levels of litigation. Uh, since McDonald closed the door on PRI clause, she originalists assert non arguments. Sorry, the end of it got cut off. Okay. Uh, um, should the end of it say... Um, you, you know, John, I'm sorry. I'm going to interview Josh, could you shut down the, the oh, chat? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is my... I, it, it, sorry. Um, I'm just... I'm finding it... I'm facing the other way, and also I'm finding it very disconcerting. Okay, so, tough. Um, I just... If you could shut down the chat, off. that would be better for me. Okay. 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 Uh, I wrote a paper about this, and I was wondering if, by extension of your argument, um, if you think originalists should assert non originalist Substance of due process has gotten a very bad name um, because of all the years that, that you know, it's been just attacked. Um, Tim Sandifer had a book, uh, The Right to an Honest Living, and there are other scholars who have said that substance of due process does have a historical pedigree. Perhaps not so much in 1787, but in 1868, that the notion that the due process that substance was valid. Um, this might be what Professor Solomon's called in originalism second best, that if we can't go PRI, we have to accept due process. And uh, we're not going to say that the Bill of Rights should not be incorporated at all because we've done it incorrectly. Um, and if I, if I can lead into another point, that even though we know Slaughterhouse was wrong, and the four justices the majority of McDonald effectively conceded that Slaughterhouse was wrong, and the four dissenters and just, it, it, the four dissenters McDonald really couldn't say anything against Slaughterhouse. No one rebutted Justice Thomas. I, I think that's, that's a slight realization that, listen, like, whoopsie, we made a mistake, but we're not going to go back. And unlike federalism and Commerce Plus cases, there's not much fertile ground left for incorporation. There just isn't. Um, I think the Seventh Amendment and the, uh, the, the, the unanimous verdict clause and a couple other clauses haven't been incorporated, but there's just not much left there. In fact, the Supreme Court denied cert in a unanimous verdict clause that was challenging Apodaca about a year or two ago. Uh, Eugene Volk had a cert petition on that. But the, um, but the general notion is that is not quite as big of a deal as it is for federalism because there are ways the government can go further and try and expand their powers. Yes, sir. Uh, one of my criticisms was maybe an over-attribution to originalism and an under-attribution to popular constitutionalism. So you, you mentioned how important it was that it was 70% unpopular and, and Professor Barnett mentions that the Tea Party you know, ground level support was important. So I'm, I'm curious if, if you think that the case would have gotten nearly as far as the favorability of It would have gone, I don't think it would have gone very far. Um, I think I made this point somewhere that uh, that had it not had this populist support behind it, it wouldn't have gotten to the, you know, wouldn't have gone to the starting line. I think that's right. There are lots of crazy constitutional challenges that start every day. I mean, you guys are really smart lawyers. You're, you know, you'll be lawyers in a year or so. You come up with some pretty smart constitutional arguments, but unless someone's willing to buy it, you're not going anywhere. And this, is, I think, is a, a capture well between a Balkan and Barnett blog exchange that a lot of these where Jack said, uh, where, where Professor Balkin said, uh, Professor Barnett is not trying to just convince you you're right. He's right. He's also trying to convince you that this idea is not frivolous. So there's this idea that in order to bring the idea from off the wall to on the wall, you need to simultaneously convince people that this argument has merit and it's accepted. You need both of those at the same time. It's not enough to just say an argument has merit. You need to see that people are accepting it. And because people accept it, that means it has merit. There's this chicken and the egg feed, feedback loop. Um, and that's something that was done very quickly. And I don't think it could have been done unless there was this popular support there. And when I say popular support, I'm going to be more specific in saying Republicans, Tea Party, there were established elements of society yearning and craving for a constitutional uh, 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 vision. Um, and at the same time, they had uh, uh, this opportunity with the ACA to go after it. So isn't it, isn't it just that originalist scholars are doing the work, not originalism itself, like as originalism? The original scholars got it to the point where, you know, like Professor Barnett, got it to the point of being ex acceptable, but really popular constitutionalism is doing the work. 
Well, I think I think that's what scholars do, um, and, and I don't say that lightly. But there's a reason why people spend their entire lives studying an area of law and are considered experts when a politician says, "Hey, what about this this provision?" They can call a scholar. Um, I think that, that 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 that's that's a good thing when. You know, usually people on the Hill don't really listen to professors very much. They, they kind of scoff at them, and people on the court kind of scoff at them. But they don't scoff so much when the arguments they make help to understand the Constitution and advance arguments. Um, I, th I think Professor Barnett and others played an invaluable role, uh, I'm sorry, an extremely valuable role in advancing this idea. Uh, because without the intellectual groundwork, I mean, if you look at the legislative history, when this law first began, the arguments were so crude, and they were so unrefined. You know, so like Congress can't regulate inactivity. You know, it was a very simple argument, but would not get very far. So then there were nuances. Professor Barnett, Todd Gaziano, Nate Stewart, they had this entire heritage paper that said, well, it's not just inactivity or activity, it's classes of activities. They looked to the language of race, and they said, okay, how does this fit in with race? And they developed a nuance argument. The tax argument, that was something that had to be developed. You know, uh, whether it was a facial and as applied challenge, these are very discrete decisions that had to be made, and, and thankfully people with experience were able to make these decisions. So it would not be enough to just hire, uh, you know, you know, have a Republican hire Paul Clement to just grace forward, grace, go straight for it. You need to develop these ideas at the outset. Is your hand up, Mr. Burnett? Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to explore this question. I'm not sure I understood the question completely. I thought maybe you could elaborate a little yeah. more about what you are positing as the relationship between what you're calling originalist scholarship and what you're calling popular constitutionalism. I just didn't quite get the whole point. Yeah, so I probably didn't articulate it that well, but I meant, so since you and the other challengers didn't advance an explicit, explicitly originalist argument, my question was, you as an originalist, originalist scholar, it, you know, has a lot of the, drove a lot of the success of the litigation, but since you didn't advance um, and a really ori originalist argument is more of a win for libertarianism and the things that originalists try to achieve, like libertarianism, rather than a win for orig originalism as a method of constitutional interpretation. It didn't didn't you, ask, were you did you ask in your paper about sort of whether it was originalist whole? Or maybe that was. What, what's your name, sir? I, I find uh, it. Bring it up. It was Zach. Zach? Yeah. yeah, Zach had Zach had a comment in his paper about sort of a, a variation of this question, which is, was originalism sort of operating in the background as a force? And I think you're you're maintaining in the paper that it was right. So 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 there's this question, sort of. Was originalism sort of operating in the background, uh, uh, pulling the justices uh, uh, towards the specific doctrinal arguments that were made um, uh, to the Supreme Court, for example, or in the lower courts, right? That would be one theory, is that, that, that originalism was significant even though it was off stage. And then another account may be, might be something like, well, you know, original, originalism wasn't playing a role here, it wasn't in the briefs, uh, there wasn't that much, uh, 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 there, there really wasn't a focus at all, that something else was doing the work, and that the theory there might be that it was popular constitutionalism, that this was opposition to the legislation and um, uh, sort of the appeal of the argument that mandates were different, that that's what was really doing the work. Mm -hmm. Can I take a crack at this? I mean, I'm not sure. I, this is really very complicated, and I'm not sure I know exactly how much of which was playing at what time. I, I think this idea that originalism, first of all, originalism played no role, as, as Josh accurately reports in the litigation or any of the public, most of the public argumentation, but. I do think it played a role, it has played a role for many years in um, delegitimizing the unlimited reading of the, of the New Deal settlement, which is, that, which is the law professor's reading and was in fact some judge's reading in the past, which is that with respect to the national economy, Congress has unlimited plenary power to do what it wants, at, subject only to express constraints like the Bill of Rights and an unenumerated right like privacy or something. But other than that, Congress can do what it wants. That was the law professor's reading, beginning with 
the new federalism that was arrested, but I think it was arrested because at least by the 90s when Lopez was decided, the original, uh, the fact that the New Deal had gone beyond the original meaning was considered both true and generally acknowledged by everybody, actually, always has been, and bad. So it's not only true, but it also is not great. That didn't mean anybody was prepared to repeal it or go back. In fact, I think most conservative judges just, and justices are simply not, only Justice Thomas, I think, would be prepared to do something like that, one justice. Um, but it does exert, I think, in the background, this kind of gravitational force where it basically says, fine, you can go as far as you've gone. We're not, we're not going back on that. We're not going to pull it back. But if you want to go farther than that, sort of escape and go farther than that, you just don't get an automatic pass to do that. If you listen to the law professors who said this challenge was frivolous in day one, their view was, what are you talking about? Are you serious? I mean, that's Pelosi, but that's what the, are you serious? Of course you could, we, it's a national economy, it's an economic regulation. If you don't understand, you can do whatever you want. That, that's, that's the law. But it wasn't, it turns out. It wasn't the law. What was really more the law of five justices, not six, but a five justices was, because of this fundamental illegitimacy that has that seed has now been planted, if you want to go farther, you better justify it. And by the way, this far, no farther. Uh, I mean, Josh doesn't, I think he gets this right in the paper. It isn't literally you cannot go farther. It's just that the burden is on you to justify if you go farther. That's all. It's not, it's not like there is a line and we will not let you go. Right. But, if, but what we're not going to allow is unlimited power. If your argument, if the basis of your argument leads to unlimited power, whether that's not a position we're prepared to accept. That was what Drew Days found out in his oral argument in the Lopez case. And that's been true now since 1995. So at what was up in the air was whether that had ended with Chief Justice Rehnquist's death and Justice O'Connor's retirement and whether and the Rage case. And the law professors had reverted to their previous view that said, no, no, we were right all along. It's anything goes. And now they thought going into this case, that's what it was. So originalism there in the background, doing important work, but not in the foreground in really any way, shape, or form. It, it is, it's already shaped the battle space for 20 years. And with another, you know, with another retirement and another appointment, that battle space will be changed again. But is that, is that an answer to the yeah. question? So it, it, it's sort of like a, a spectrum almost. You have the law professor's version uh, on all, you know, coincidentally on the left side and on the, on the right side you have originalism, libertarian outcome, and the new federal federalism cases pushed pushed it closer to the originalist version, but not all the way there. And then this yeah, case, uh, but I would put libert I take libertarian out of what you just said. I mean, okay. I don't think libertarian plays into that yet. Or a more limited role for the federal government, you know. Well, it's li enumerated it, it, right, enumerated powers, right. right. And so new federalism pushed it closer to that reading of the Constitution. And then the question in this case, whether or not it would go farther in the direction of making the government adhere to their enumerated powers or towards the direction that most law professors, including my common law professor, Professor Gottesman, thought was you know, an obvious case. Right. I mean, I just think that the law professors have a, their own willful, willful, I don't mean that in a bad way, but they have their own reading that they thought was right up till 95. They thought was right after 95, but at 2000 with Morrison, they started to have doubts, existential doubts about whether they were right in their reading. And then with Raich, they breathed a sigh of relief and thought, oh, well, we were right all along, and so just forget about it. And so that's where they were coming from. They, it, it, because it was this very long-standing gestalt that they've had. And I don't think they fully appreciated what exactly the new federalism gestalt was. This is what this is why this is an important this gestalt idea is an important idea. They thought the only alternative to their view was going back before the New Deal. And since they knew there was no will by anybody except Justice Thomas to go back before the New Deal, they were they were right. They were they don't under, they didn't understand there was this in between gestalt. Uh, which was the this far and no farther. But and and then my earlier point was that's being so, because that, by the way, looks to be, them to be completely unprincipled. Why? Why in God's name would it be this far and no farther? I mean, the logical implication of the New Deal is they ought to be, the, the federal government ought to have, the Congress ought to have plenary power over the national economy. That's what ought to be. 
that's what they basically said was going to happen. So why are you saying, oh, well, just because they only went that far, they can't go any farther than that? What possible sense that makes? That's stupid. Unless you take an originalism as your background, in the background, which they don't. They repudiate that. But if other people do take originalism as sort of this background gravitational force, it's not stupid to say, you've gone in the wrong direction, we are not going to pull back, but if you want to go any farther, you don't get a right, you don't, just because you've made these five steps in the wrong direction doesn't give you a power to go to an infinity in the wrong direction. If you're going to go any farther, you're going to have to justify that. Uh, and that's why, that's what they don't, that's what they didn't get. And nobody knew for a fact, I certainly didn't know for a fact, that this gestalt was still going to operate. In fact, I think Judge Sutton's opinion, and I think the reason why Kavanaugh and Sutton sat on their hands is because they didn't know either. And they know these justices a whole lot better than I do. And I think they were betting there weren't going to be five votes, and they didn't want to be left holding the bag in case they get nominated in the future and having made an extreme ruling as an appellate court judge to invalidate this law, and that would make them crazy, and they can't. They want, they want to be on the court. So they try to get out from the, under the out of the way because they feel they didn't think there was five votes necessarily. Yeah. That was really helpful. And so then basically you get to what Professor Solomon calls originalist second best without using expre expressly using originalism in your arguments. I mean, the other thing that I thought you were talking about that I, I just want to emphasize because it got lost in this talk about originalism is all the stuff you were talking about popular constitutionalism. That is what was necessary to make this whole thing work. I mean, that, that was what the We've talked about originalism in way in the background re re represent, uh, responsible for the Gestalt, but that doesn't tell you how this case is going to go. And how the case is going to go was this popular constitutional idea, which was um, out in the public. Bringing it to the people. Yeah. And th that was perhaps the most um, interesting aspect of this case, is how these ideas disseminated from the ivory tower to the people. I mean, you actually have you know, college professors testifying on Capitol Hill. You have people, you know, talking at tea parties about the Constitution. You have people going on Fox News and, and cable news talking about this. And this was a way that these ideas disseminated. And it happened so quickly, too. The speed is just, is just fascinating how quickly these ideas permeated throughout our collective consciousness. How most people probably never even knew what the Commerce Clause was before this case. But after this case, people might say, oh, yeah, insurance isn't commerce. You know, people, people might make these kind of arguments. But, uh, good question. Sir, question? So their opinions or their arguments Well, isn't that the point of popular constitutional? The constitution is what people say it is? Or, or let me let me be more precise. That 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 the understanding of our constitution is informed by how people feel about you know certain values, government, individual rights, liberty. That sounds like a very bonded esque comment to make if you're a judicial conservative or an originalist. Well, I mean, I'm not a, I would not call myself a judicial conservative. And I think by and large, Balkan's writings has been a playbook for what what libertarians did in this case. I mean, what, what Jack has written about is speaking to the people and spreading these ideas. And that's why I think there is some tension between the originalism and the popular constitutionalism. So I think that this kind of meme, which I think Professor Barnett and I agree that, while originalism is playing in the background, the popular constitutionalism is informed by that originalism. So we're not just preaching some sort of living constitutionalism. The libertarians are preaching some sort of uh, 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 originalist version of the constitution. Sir? So, so the popular I don't think we've ever made the Supreme Court. I mean, if it was that. I'm sorry, but whether it makes the Supreme Court doesn't change whether or not it's constitutional. The question is still either doesn't be settled with a different level. I don't think with that popular sentiment, the Gestalt would have been uh, shifted. I think the Gestalt would have made the same. And, um, but, but well, let, let me focus on one point, though. Even if the numbers were the other way around, the Solicitor General and the government was never really able to justify you know, what their limit was. They weren't. Um, Professor Barnett mentioned Drew Days. If you go back and listen to the oral argument on USB Lopez, there's a point where the, the is it Rehnquist, someone asked Drew Days, Mayo O'Connor, you know, what's your limiting principle? And he basically says, we don't have one. He, he basically says, there is not. Um, if, you, if you look at some of the earlier litigation of the healthcare case, when asked, what's your limiting principle, they said Lopez and Morrison. Um, that concedes that that's the bound, that, that that's their, that's the principle. They, and that's why I say we look at the cases litigated. They said Lopez and Morrison, but then they got smarter. And Katyal and other people who were 
you know, higher up in the food chain said, no, 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 we have this other idea about, you know, it's healthcare special, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a unique market that there's only a way of free rider problems, all these, all these other theories. But the initial theory was Lopez and Marsden. So even if, you know, they couldn't have come up with, even if this law was widely popular, I still think the government had some serious problems justifying it. I think that's what, that's what shocked the professoriate, that they couldn't, with a straight face, argue this under the, under the existing precedents, because just it wasn't the same. You've had to have gone further. Yes, sir? But arguing that it doesn't satisfy the existing precedents is entirely different from arguing that it's based on popular constitutionalism. Let, let, let's separate two things. I'm not saying that the popular constitution makes unconstitutional. I'm saying that I'm saying that when people speak about the Constitution in public, that informs public debates. And that is able to kind of transcend what people think about how the court should rule. Even with what I just said, the notion that there are enumerated powers and that the New Deal settlement was somewhat not plenary, when those two factors play together, I think that's what we got in NFIB. I don't think it's one or the other. And I, I think it's a mistake to think because of popular constitutionalism, the law was almost struck down. I think that, that, that's, that's asking too much. I think when you have these dynamics, and I think this really plays into what future constitutional challenges work. Uh, this, is a, this is a textbook. I mean, the book I'm writing will be a textbook for constitutional challenges. And I, and I mean that because you had the perfect storm of all the various factors coming up at once, where you had 20 years of scholarship about what commerce means. You know, you had the, the, this, this popular constitutionalist movement, the Tea Party, perhaps not since the Liberty League during the New Deal, where these people are saying, we need to restore the Constitution. You know, you had a, a president who had a, who had a, who had a mandate for change, and then you had all these like, little groups that were going against it. And all these kind of things came together, and were doing, able to do it quickly. Um, a good point of comparison is the Heller case. I mean, uh, Professor Barnett just taught the case a half hour ago. Um, that took a long time, and the NRA opposed it, and most Republicans opposed it. You remember President Bush, via Paul Clement, filed a brief against Heller. I mean, it was for, but it was really, really against it. The NRA tried killing that case several times. What made this case unique was almost everyone got behind the movement, and they lined up. Um, you can imagine that there are some conservatives who don't want to do this. Why? They like drug laws. Republicans can be quite statist. They might want to do something like this before, lest we forget that originally the mandate was a Republican idea. The Heritage Foundation advanced this in the early, uh, early 1990s. They, they repudiated it shortly thereafter, but this was, a, this was a conservative idea. So there are a lot of Republicans, conservatives, who, who might want this power down the road. They don't want to tie their own hands, but for this, everyone got behind the wheel and you know, they wanted the Barnett Express. Sir? Um, so I have a very kind of pop understanding of the, uh, the spending ruling in the healthcare case. Do you think that... You're talking about the Medicaid, right? Well, yeah, the yeah Medicaid. Okay. Um, and, and with state coercion. Um, do you think that originalism was playing a same... Uh, had that same gravitational pull? And if so, could you explain what that gravitational pull was for that? You, you know, the, the spending opinion, I'm still so confused with Kagan and Breyer. To, 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 just a second. I just want to make sure everyone's on board here, because if you haven't... Does everyone... But anyone need a quick explanation of what the spending power holding was? I, I would actually appreciate it as well. <laughs> uh, so, so that, you know, so um, the uh, Medicaid provisions um, provide that provided that uh, states were. Uh, 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 it's, it set up a, uh, a desired expansion of Medicaid, and then it subsidized that during an initial period completely with federal funds, and then the federal funding goes down. But if a state fails to expand Medicaid, then under the uh, provisions of the ACA as enacted, they would lose all Medicaid funding, and Medicaid funding is about 20% of most states' Of sort of, of the average state budget. And then the, what the holding does is it says that it, it makes this distinction, which you know is, is somewhat difficult to figure out in terms of other situations, but basically it says that you can't tie the old Medicaid money to their participating in the expansion, but you can condition new money 
uh, on the expansion, right? So that means that the level of the incentive is changed fairly significantly in this case, and then there's a question as to what that would mean for future cases. Yeah? Isn't the reason why it's tough to carry that over to future cases is because there's not really any such thing as old and new Medicaid funding? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean that, that implies one Congress can bind the future Congress. Congress, like, I mean... I know it's about what this kind of what That's getting to the weeds. What? That's getting to the weeds. It, well, it, well about, it, it's an important question, but, uh, but, but sort of that's the kind of problem that has to be worked out. So your question is about whether the spending clause holding, the Medicaid funding holding, how that relates to sort of the, the, the originalist backdrop for the opinion. Do I have the question right? Especially since it's a, a limitation on an enumerated power, I was curious if we thought that there was, if there was <coughs> commonalities between the this far, no further in the Congress Clause and the, that's the spending. You know, it's interesting, I'll take this in two ways. No one saw that coming. Most people thought that the Medicaid was a throwaway. And the reason why that's fascinating is at the very outset of the case back in 2009, the reason why the states got involved was because of the Medicaid funding. If you remember, there were these things called the Corn Crust for kiss Kickback, the Louisiana Purchase, where the Congress tried to pass these special carve-outs to give special funding to certain states to buy votes from, like, you know, uh, 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 Mary Landrieu and uh, the guy from Nebraska. Um, Nelson. Nelson, Nelson, thank you. Um, so originally, the entire purpose of these lawsuits was to challenge the Medicaid funding. But that never took off quite so much as the ACA, the mandate. Why? Because people tend to like Medicaid. People get old and, when they, you know, they, they're poor and they, they need, they need, they need health care. Um, so it's hard to really analyze the effect of originalism um, on that challenge. And I haven't looked at, I honestly haven't looked at the spending clause history too closely. Um, I will say that South Dakota v. Dole was probably somewhat stuck in the new federalism in an odd place uh, because it said there are some limits, just we don't know what they are. And I guess in this case, they found what those limits were. Can, can I offer Please. a possible answer Please. to that? Um, I think one way to understand the new, the Rehnquist new federalism is that given the overwhelming uh, power of Congress under the Commerce power, which the Rehnquist court was upholding, um, if you take that literally, states are basically no different than businesses. They get to, they're, they're all engaged in economic activity and they could basically be controlled by the federal government. And since that seems to run afoul of first principles of federalism, there needs to be kind of a special carve-out protection for states the way we have special carve-out protections for certain individual rights like privacy. So they, they were basically using a post-New Deal understanding of general Congress power with carve-outs. And so if you interpret the spending power broadly enough and allow conditions to be used broadly enough, the spending power will therefore overwhelm the states. And there, so there needs to be some kind of carve-out to protect the states qua states under this post-New Deal understanding, rather than thinking the states just have the power that's left after enumerated federal power, since we're way beyond those days, we have to have a carve-out. So that's, I think, been operating, that's, that states' rights part of it has been operating since the 80s, since before, before Lopez and Morris, and that came first. Your question, I'll, 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 I'll okay. <laughs> okay. find. I want to see where you're going with it. All right, sure. So, so I guess my my um, my suggestion. This is again something I suggested in, in the in the paper. Is that this is something that that liberal um, that the liberals generally, the liberal movements have been doing for a long time. I mean, look at every movement mm -hmm. um, from the '60s forward, and, and even and some before. Um, this is this is not new. Like the the idea that. There is a um, way to see the Constitution that, for instance, doesn't allow for segregation or gay um, rights. Yeah, or allow, exactly, laws for gay rights yep. or 
1920 to allow for equal, equal treatment of women. So, this is, so the liberal, the liberal or progressive movement has been doing this for a long time, and it seems that the, cons the conservative movement has kind of just figured out that this is a tactic that might work. And so, if, if that's the if that's true, if that's like if that's the case, if conservatives are just now starting to approach a tactic that has been used for a long time by progressive movements, then isn't it very likely that 10 years from now we'll be talking about a a a, uh, a shift that will be that we will be able to say like to Dave's point um, that again that we'll be able to say uh, a liberal perspective is the right way to interpret the Constitution because that's what has the popular um, the popular like sense of it, the popular mentality. I, I think that's a very fair point, um, and I make this point in the paper when original and I'll make it in two ways. When libertarians tend to divorce their methodology, originalism, from the constitutionalism, it, it has the effect of weakening it. So maybe in 10 years when popular sentiments change, things will be different. Perhaps the only way I can respond to that question is that although libertarians advance a popular constitutionalist vision, it was informed by originalism. So it was gravitated by originalism. So even though they weren't advancing, this is what commerce means, the vision that Randy and others advanced was grounded in this background fundamental principles as we have this tug, this wobble, however you want to describe it, of originalism. So they weren't they weren't advocating popular constitutionalism based on some sort of a living, breathing document. It was based on some sort of historical understanding. And you might agree or disagree, and I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but I think in that sense it's both it's different both in degree and kind from the uh, other movements of, of progressives. John. Yes, sir. Um, first of all, I really enjoyed the paper. Thank Thanks you. For, for coming. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, so, I want to ask if there's maybe some tension between sort of the, the abandonment of restraint point and the moving away from originalism point. Because it seems to me that maybe the reason why originalism wasn't advocated sort of in the foreground, right? It only has this gravitational pull is because of a kind of commitment to restraint, right? A fear that we don't we don't want to overrule the, the new rule because that would entail invalidating a lot of crap, right? We don't want to we don't want to do that because of sort of a commitment to a type of restraint, right? That the this far no farther gestalt is a lot more restraining than sort of a let's return, let's bring out the pitchforks and return to the pre New Deal Constitution gestalt, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So isn't isn't a type of restraint what is motivating uh, the, the move away from original? Yeah, I, I think the history of originalism is fascinating, and I think it was unintended. Originalism came about, you know, with, with Bork and Rehnquist and all these people, and it came about as a form of restraint, but then, what do you know? When you start researching originalism, you say, wow, the courts do have an active role in enforcing liberty. Go figure, there's something called the Ninth Amendment. You know, go figure, there's a, there's a privileges or immunities clause, you know. And, and I think originalists were almost, maybe unexpectedly taken aback that, wow, this isn't quite the restrained jurisprudence we want. And that returns to the point about engaging the entire Constitution. If you do believe that you are trying to enforce the entire Constitution, you can't just pick and choose. You can't say, well, we'll look at the power constraining functions, I'm sorry, we'll look at the, at the liberty constraining functions very narrowly, we'll look at the power granting functions broadly, that's not being particularly originalist. So I think originalists can almost hoist themselves up on their petards in that sense. If they were trying to be restrained, they couldn't. Um, and I think now you have to uh, divorce yourself from that to be restrained. Um, now, now you have various trans originalism. You have uh, Balkans living originalism, and now you have Akil Mars, whatever you want to call it. You have various strands. Um, he was in your class, sorry. So, so you have, you have various ways of approaching it, and, and I'm, not, I'm not advocating one is better than the other. But just specifically among conservatives, I think originalism has gotten away from them because it's not doing what they thought it would do, which is be restrained. It's not doing that. Heller was not a restrained opinion. They struck down a, a popularly enacted piece of legislation that the people of D.C. wanted by a large majority. You know, Citizens United was not an act of restraint. They struck down a piece of law that now is, that case is wildly unpopular. The president, you know, yelled at the Supreme Court when they were sitting right there to save the union. So, originalism doesn't always lead to restrained results, and that perhaps is not something that Bork or Rehnquist might have anticipated in the 70s and 80s, or at least for sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I want to talk about these things in the paper as lessons. Like, what does it mean for people strategically litigating in the future? Because a lot of the situation seems very fact-specific, right? Like, there's not always this large popular movement that you can leverage in the way um, that has been done. And this, this argument that, like, this far, no further, you know, won't work for a wide variety of cases.
cases where you know, you're already you've gone this far. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted you to sort of comment on what you think the actual lesson is. Like, what do you do as someone strategically litigating to get the Constitution closer to the original meaning? Okay, so I think it's, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, you guys know at the Institute for Justice, are you familiar with their work? They're, they're a libertarian law firm based in Arlington. And, and, and they're very good at doing a lot of things. One thing they're very good at is making arguments that are very compelling to people. They have a niche of finding clients who are very sympathetic. So, for example, their big, their big case was uh, the African hair braiders in, in Washington, D.C. And in order to be a hair braider, you were required to be a licensed cosmetologist, which required going to school for years and years and years, even though you never did that, you just braided hair. And they were actually to get a law struck down under rational basis review. So to answer your question, I think one of the, one of the key first steps is finding something that, that speaks to people, framing your argument in a way that, that can tap into some of the, the broader popular sentiments. Um, if, if this same case, to, to use the gentleman's example, if this was 70% popularity and you didn't have people rallying in the Tea Party holding the signs saying, you know, teach Nancy Pelosi, you know, remove Nancy Pelosi, you would not have the same kind of groundswell. And we don't have the groundswell, you don't have the media exposure, you don't have the opportunities to advance the ideas in the sphere, and you don't have the funding. This, this, this was a well-funded challenge. Um, so I think that, that plays into it as well. So I think you really need to have the academic background, you need to have the scholarly productivity. That's why I think in my last paragraph I said, even if originalism wasn't used directly, it's still important to kind of tug. I think you need scholars developing the scholarship. Creative work for myself, I suppose. But you know, you need scholarships to develop the scholarship. And you also need to have people who can communicate with the public at large. And when those two factors combine, I think you set yourself up for a lot. I mean, look at the Second Amendment. The NRA has spent 30 years preaching about the Second Amendment, and although they opposed Heller, that was able to inculcate in the people that this kind of sentiment that, wow, we, the government can't ban handguns. And I think that was able to push forward to the case. If you, if you, look, if you brought Heller in the 1960s when you had the, you know, the war on crime and all these big you know, shootings and assassinations, it probably wouldn't have gotten very far because people wanted gun control. That's why the Gun Control Act of, uh, uh, was passed. Shortly after the assassination, was it Kennedy? No, um, Martin Luther King or Robert Kennedy? One of those. Okay. So I saw a hand somewhere here. -ish. Well, actually, it, Meg, you, your paper also um, discussed sort of a related question, in which we haven't yet gotten to, and 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 several of the other papers discuss this. This is sort of the idea of an original second best, mm -hmm. and so there were several comments about this. Um, and, and one one. Uh, that was in several of the papers had to do with the question whether or not um, pushing the doctrinal um, argument, sort of the this far no further, um, uh, uh, accepting uh, a New Deal and Warren Court precedent strategy might actually be counterproductive for originalists because it puts originalists in the position of um, of uh, legitimating the very precedents that are unoriginalist in their methodology. Um, no, that, that's a very good point. I saw a few of you raise that. I think, I think to answer that question, you need to kind of look at what people like uh, Professor Barnett and others did with, with the healthcare case. And listen, we're not conceding Wickard was right. We're not conceding that you know Darby was right. We're litigating under the premise that they're the settled law. Um, I think that's the best you can hope for as an originalist. Uh, and I make this point in a couple ways, but if you look at a case like Heller, one of the reasons why you had both the majority and justices, you know, all nine justices writing originalism was because there was nothing 